Hey, what's going on, guys? One, first of all, thank you guys so much for watching. We do have a new week, which means, of course, we have new market trends in the comic community. Three up, three down starts right now. Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Brian and Jack with Superman's Comics. We are helping to amplify the comic book collection through integrity and community. We do a lot of comic and pop culture content on this channel. So if you're new here, consider subscribing. Speaking of new content, we just premiered a brand new podcast yesterday on the channel, didn't we, Jack? We did. And, you know, I, I love when we bring out new content, but this is one that I think I'm exceptionally excited for, uh, you know, because this one involves the community. Uh, we've talked about doing a podcast on the Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel where it's both for YouTube and for the audio listeners out there who are listening on their commutes. Um, and we thought of a panel and we thought, you know what? We have so many people. We're going to bring on two new guests every other week. And we are going to talk about the hottest topics in comics, whether it's the secondary market, the industry, uh, whether it's what's going on on social media or what's going on in our personal collections. We are going to talk about it right here and bring it to you every other week right here on the Civil Men's Comics YouTube channel. Yeah, so check out the first episode. It's up on the channel right now. We'll also put a link in the description of this video, as well as a card up above here. So you can check out that first episode of Simple Man's Comics and Friends. With that being said, we're going to get right into the three up, three down, starting with that hot portion this week. And we're going to start with Marvel DC crossovers. Why are these up right now, Jack? Well, there's a lot of talk right now about uh, the, the state of DC Comics. Um, now, Today, of course, we saw the uh, transition of CEOs out of nowhere from Disney. But um, within the last week, we've seen DC Comics uh, fire or separate in some capacity from uh, Dan Didio, who is the longtime uh, CEO editor-in-chief of the DC Comics publishing side of the business. And this has kind of left a lot of questions. Uh, ever since AT&T acquired Warner Brothers, there was talk immediately that AT&T didn't want to be in the publishing business. It's, it's small potatoes, whether it's profitable or not profitable. It's not the kind of business they want to be in. They want this IP for the movies. So there was a lot of talk early on about this far-fetched scenario where DC licenses out their characters to another publishing company and that publishing company most likely being Marvel Comics. Now, that seemed to be pure speculation, but since the firing of Didio and the lack of a replacement, it's not like DC's come out and immediately named a replacement. Warner Brothers has been silent on the subject. AT&T has been silent on the subject. Um, this has left people kind of questioning. And we've seen those typical rumor sites, whether it's Cosmic Book News or you name it, running reports that this is happening, that um, in 2021, DC is going to get out of publishing comics and license these characters out. But most of this secondary market action I see seems to be in response to an article written on lordsofthelongbox.com with Tim Votivo, uh, the YouTube channel, their website, where he didn't really say that this was per se happening. He laid out the three rumors that are being discussed and one of which is this crossover, but that's what everyone seems to latch on to because, Brian, let's be honest, right? We're wrestling fans. We love to fantasy book our dream matchups. What is a bigger matchup than Marvel versus DC? And mind you, this is all coming at a time when we have Thor number two rocketing in the back issue market because of seemingly a cameo from Superman, Green Lantern, uh, and The Flash right there in the issue. Um, so is this Donny Cates just being creative or, or, you know, being funny or is there something bigger at works? So, yeah, no doubt these Marvel DC crossover titles are hot right now. Me, I'm not personally a fan if Disney were to pick up or the publishing rights for that because then you have everything in one house. I'm not a big fan of that. I'm sure a lot of other people out there probably, you know, I kind of like difference. I like different people, different books. That kind of makes it, I don't want all one voice telling all the stories. But there's no denying right now that these books are on the upward trend. Yeah, and they're starting to sell. These are books, Brian, that mainly, um, we're talking about whether it's the DC versus Marvel 
crossover titles, which was a, a mini series, whether it's the trade paperbacks, which are selling very strong right now, or whether or not it, it is these amalgam titles, which I don't think would really play into this whole scenario. But I just think that all of this talk about Marvel and DC crossing over has people kind of excited. I'm seeing a lot more posts on social media of characters like Dark Claw or um, Bruce Wayne, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. And uh, these kinds of books are essentially what ifs, but now can be written into stories if this was to play out. So we're not talking about big money here, but that's kind of the beauty of this show is we're telling you what is on the upward rise. There is still time to get in on this if you're a true believer that this is going to happen. But I tend to be with Brian where this um, makes me afraid. I remember to use wrestling again when WWE bought WCW and we thought we were going to get all these amazing matchups and we ended up getting a diet version of WCW. And I'm afraid that that's what would happen here with DC going to Marvel, but we're gonna have to wait and see. Yeah. But with that being said, we're just going to move right along into the next three up portion. And that is going to be red Hulk. We're seeing these books Definitely hot right now. They're definitely going up on eBay and they're selling quite quickly. Well, you know, and I hate to beat like the same drum over and over again, but again, this comes from the same uh, sort of movie sources. We're seeing the same discussion um, and, you know, the, the community is, is really at this point feverish for any of these leaks that they're getting or any of these rumors um, and one that's been strong for a long time is that we're going to see Red Hulk in the MCU. Now, of course, we've already met General Ross. That's a long-standing thing. Um, but the talk about the Thunderbolts coming into the MCU, possibly through the Disney Plus streaming service, um, only gives more credence to the belief that Red Hulk is coming. Um, because, you know, in I think the third incarnation of the team, one of the most kind of cult popular versions where we also had like Elektra and Deadpool and Punisher, um, Red Hulk was featured as a part of the team. And I think that, you know, we're seeing the first appearance spike, of course, Hulk number one, I think it's from 2008. Um, that book is spiking its variants, ladder printings, all of that is doing exceptionally well in the secondary market. But we're also coming out of New York Toy Fair, where we also saw Marvel Legends. Their kind of like big highlighted figure that they were out there promoting was a Red Hulk figure. And a lot of times this synergy is not by accident. There is actually some discussion going on um, in Disney or Marvel that we need to start promoting and uh, getting these characters out there. So Red Hulk is a character to be on the lookout for. Now, these books are hot and the prices are spiking, but there may still be some sitting in back issue bins that are priced with those yesterday prices that we all love, uh, and you can cash in on today's market value. Yeah, when I saw some other movie news where they're looking to cast the Allison Bree type person for She-Hulk, and she's even in the running for it, possibly, which I'm all about that. Not Red Hulk, but a She-Hulk. They're going to have to do a lot of CGI, but yeah, she's awesome. But moving on, the last one on three up portion this week is Masters of the Universe. Now, this is always up in my opinion, just because I'm a huge fan, but we are seeing a resurgence between all the new cycle. We're seeing new Funko Pops. We're seeing um, they just announced this huge voice cast, awesome voice cast for this Netflix Kevin Smith animated series. And then also that recent comic book series right now is just a great read. No, Brian, it's absolutely all of those points and kind of uh, so many more. My investment or speculation style has always been to pay attention to trends. And trends aren't always what someone is posting on social media, right? That hot book that this speculator is saying. You got to kind of take a step back a bit and see what's happening in the market. And I am not surprised to see Masters of the Universe get hot. We're talking about that DC Presents 47, Masters of the Universe number one, the mini book, the books that came with the action figures, those rare variants, whether we're talking MaddieToys.com, Spoon.org. Uh, hey, yeah. All of it is getting hot. The image series that long got forgotten about that has some amazing uh, cover artists that did work on some of those books. All of that is heating up and, you know, it, it's evident on the secondary market. And why? Well, we've talked about Masters of the Universe before. Obviously, it, it being one of Brian's passions, 
oh, it's of course it's going to be something we talk about similar to the way I bring up GI Joe or Ninja Turtles. But similar to those properties, if you really sit back and look at what's happening on the market, um, Masters of the Universe is probably six to 12 months from being everywhere, just absolutely everywhere. And when I say everywhere, what do I mean by that? I mean, TV show, movie, toys, um, all kinds of soft goods. You are going to start to see Masters of the Universe everywhere. And how do you know this? Well, to bring it up again, New York Toy Fair. Take a look around New York Toy Fair. You mentioned Funko. Funko went from kind of sheepishly putting out a, a Master of the Universe, a small Master of the Universe wave, uh, and then a follow up to now unveiling multiple waves, uh, ten inch Skeletor. Um, but that wasn't it. We saw Masters of the Universe represented and licensed almost at every single major toy manufacturer. The reality that we're going to get live action He Man, cartoon He Man. He-Man toys in every every form. Um, the fact that other 80s properties like Ninja Turtles and Ghostbusters are coming back into prominence. I think that there is a little bit of a movement here. And I'm not saying it's going to lead to this boom in comics, but I think the trend we're seeing right now where people are starting to say, you know, I need to get that book. I need to get those books that are undervalued. I think it's going to continue. And I think we're going to continue to see a rise in Masters of the Universe prices. So, if you see those undervalued keys, I would absolutely take a look at them. Um, I think that over the next six months to a year, we're only going to see that trend continue. And if you see the Marvel star He-Man number six and a nine, eight, holler at me because I've been trying to pick that up for two and a half, three years now. That's the last one I need for that whole Marvel star collection in nine, eight. But that's the three out portion. We're just going to rotate right now into the downward trends. Starting with Joker's daughter. Now, I remember not too long ago, Joker's daughter was the talk of the town, especially when the lenticular covers came out and they're talking about the old Batman family books. And Joker's daughter, you're not hearing much about right now because you're also hearing a bunch of, they're introducing a bunch of new villains as well. Right. And I think it, that the talk of punchline is what really makes me think of Joker's daughter. Um, I don't fault anybody for their buying purchases. We talked about this. You mentioned the podcast. We talked about this topic on the podcast. Um, you know, buy what you like. And that includes even a comic that maybe I think is overpriced. Um, I just think that the punchline book is moving so fast and furiously. And sometimes we have a tendency to think, well, this is the next greatest thing. Um, this is the next Harley. That's what we've heard, right? But what people seem to forget was this, this is something we've seen before. Um, Joker's daughter was supposed to be that character, right? Was, if you remember, um, if you were around in this game long enough to the early days of the new 52, um, when the lenticular covers came uh, during the Villains Month, it was the biggest smash success. And nothing was hotter than Joker's daughter. It was Cat, that in, um, was Cat Catwoman, Catwoman, issue two, Catwoman right? 23 the, is the first appearance. Um, there's a second print that's pretty rare. Um, Catwoman 24 is the second appearance, which is the first time she's featured on a cover. Um, those books all commanded solid market price. I mean, we're talking $25 for the first appearance, $15 for the second appearance. And again, that's not the punchline price, but that's why we're, we who have been in the game as long as we have are surprised by that. But it was immediate. Um, and there was some sense to it because Catwoman was a lesser printed title and Joker's daughter, same with punchline seemed to provide a natural foe for Catwoman, um, natural foe for Harley Quinn. Uh, we are now two years later or, or not two years later, we're five, six years later. And this character is gone. I mean, just not, no one's writing this character in the stories. Uh, it, it, it's just non-existent. And you mentioned the Batman family books. So there was a previous incarnation of the character. It's not the one that we saw in the new 52. Um, her name was Dwella Dent. She actually had ties to Harvey Dent. Um, that Bat family number five and Bat family number six, her kind of like first appearance and then like first cover got popular. Now they're trading for $15, $20. So, you know, that's not, the value is not there. Now, granted, ugly covers, very much reminiscent of the first Rogue. But, you know, just one of those things where I use this to just caution about Punchline while 
um, get your money. Uh, I fault nobody who's out here flipping. I mean, that's what I, I mean, that's, I, I'm not holding this book. Um, but be careful because if you do hold this book, you could be sitting on a stack of Catwoman 23s. Not a bad book. Catwoman 23 could have its day again. But you have to rely on DC Publishing to continue to use this character and think about what we just talked about earlier on the hot portion of this video about DC Publishing. Then the next one we're talking about on the three down, we were just talking about this being hot not too long ago. We're talking about Umbrella Academy. Yeah, and you know, I, I think this book has been used as a prime example of the spec cycle when it comes to independent comics. Um, this, I want to alert people to this book because I don't think people realize how cheap this is. We're talking, and then when I say book, there's actually a few. Um, of course, the, uh, the Apocalypse number one book, which was a $150 type book, is now solidly in high grade, sitting in the mid 60s, um, in mid grade, can kind of, or not mid grade, but like a VF near mint um, listing can go for in like the 30s to 40s range. And that free comic book day issue, which really is the first appearance and was kind of championed as such, which at one point was as well, like a $100, $150 book. I've seen listings for books listed at 90, 92, 94, as low as 16 to 18 dollars um, for final sale prices. Uh, a lot of a lot of books selling in the 30s, a lot of books selling in the 40s. There is so much meat on the bone, and I think people forget how much that that television show captivated um, not just the comic books community, but really social media in general and the kind of television watching community. People really loved that show. Um, but it was such a smash. It, they didn't have a second season ordered prior to the first season coming out. If you watch the show, it's not a show that's going to be a quick to develop show. Um, so we're in a slowdown process waiting on that second season. If you're on the Netflix app and you go to Umbrella Academy, it says season two is coming. Yeah. Plus it seems like all that attention that was on Umbrella Academy is currently on lock and key. Either way, yeah, like you said, this makes a, a great buying opportunity, especially if those books drop. But that's also something to be aware of because it tells you when it's not active, those books do go back down to the almost the previous value of where they before. So if you're buying them for that reason, is it going to be sustainable? What happens when the show just goes away and no one's talking about Umbrella Academy anymore? Either way. Yeah. And even if you love a, a book or a show, I don't begrudge somebody for selling the book at the high of 150, just with the express written content, uh, con <laughs> just with the express written intent of going back and picking it up later for 36 and pocketing that difference. If you have the patience to do that, by all means, um, do that because that's the beauty of comic books, right? There, there's very few that ever dry up totally on the market and aren't available. You can always get that shot again. And with these indie properties, especially these ones tied to television properties, you are right, Brian. It just, it is to a T, they will all fall. The Strain. <laughs> yes. Which was a great show and a great book. Yeah, those books though, man. I remember that summer before that show came off. Variants and stuff. They're, yeah. Insane. But, then the last one we're talking about on the three down portion this week is... House of X, Powers of X. I still, this is coming from someone who's not a big X-Men fan. I still actually like this series. It's one of the better series. It kind of made me interested in X-Men again until 10,000 X-Men books titles came out of it. But either way, you're starting to see that downward trend. But why do you think that is, Jack? It's very similar to Umbrella Academy. It's just the readership cycle. Everybody's moved on from that story. Um, and this happens with miniseries, but... I may not be the biggest fan of House of X, uh, Powers of Ten. I've been very open about that. But I also, I often talk about respecting other people's fandoms, putting my money where other people um, desire items. Uh, you know, I never flipped a My Little Pony book because I love My Little Pony. That, that wasn't the point. Um, so I have actually bought a lot of these House of X, Powers of Ten books over the last several months since the craze has started to die down because when we were around Christmas time and there were those dollar sales, there was a lot of those later issues. Yeah, especially the, those flower variants and... All of that, 75% off or more. 
Um, I picked up a stack of issue number five that I remember thinking to myself, why did I buy this? I, when I was checking, doing research, I saw, well, issue number five of House, House of X is selling for like nine bucks. Now that's nine bucks isn't anything to like write home about. But when you paid a dollar for the book, you feel like you're already doing pretty well. Um, the late printings, a lot of those were available. Um, a lot of those were recolored connecting covers done by Mark Brooks. The Mark Brooks connecting covers, which at one point were just on fire, have now become extremely reasonable. The overall sets of, of the books, the 12 book set, um, it's selling for a fraction of what it was selling for several months ago. I think this is a classic storyline. When this storyline first came out, we heard people say, they should just make this an X-Men movie. And I could see that happening one day. But beyond that happening, I think this whole Krakoa concept, I think, is certainly going to be something that is, is delved into at some point in the MCU. And that will draw attention. So there it is, guys. That's the three up, three down this week. Let us know in the comments. What do you think? What do you think is hot? What do you think is cold? And what do you think of these picks as well? As we always say, a lot of times on the downward trend, that presents great buying opportunities. But either way, let us know what you think. But before we go, we have a giveaway to announce the winner for, right? That's right, Brian. We're giving away three of these great independent comics retailer exclusive variants that Brian and I had a hand in the development of through comicbookinvest.com and CBSI. And these are all going out to one winner. We're going to throw that winning commenter's comment up on the screen right now. We put them in that good random.org organizer, drew one. And here we go. We've got, we got issues and uh, you know, his big book that he said that people are overlooking from the independent comic scene is Savage Bastards, brand new one from Mad Cave Studios that just released a couple weeks ago. So be on the lookout for Savage Bastards, great Western independent comic if you haven't checked it out. Um, and we got issues. I hope you enjoy these books. Make sure you hit up simplementscomics at gmail.com and we will get that information from you and get these books right out to you. And be sure to be on the lookout for more contests in the future, hitting the channel where we can get you some more great books. Yeah, so again, congratulations to We Got Issues. That's the three up and three down for this week. This is Brian and Jack with Superman's Comics. We'll see you guys in the next video. I hit record a job, you can't ignore it.